Good morning. It is Sunday, and let me see, what is the date here? It is Sunday the 14th, and it's snowy, and so we canceled church, and my good friend Jonathan is here helping run some sound, because he was already here, and so I am talking to empty chairs for the first time ever. Uh, we did not do this in COVID, and so... Uh, this is a new experience, and I just felt like that uh, it's really important for us to finish up this series of studies, uh, especially as we're kind of looking ahead and kind of trying to line things out Sunday to Sunday. And so here I am, and we are going to dive into 1 Corinthians 14, and this will be the, I believe, fifth and final study of our study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And... I am so grateful for what God has given us in his word to help us understand these things, to help us work through these things, because I think the church would be left in a real uh, difficult state because of all the confusion and division over these particular things. And so before we get started, I want to pray and uh, ask, invite the Lord here and bear with me. This is a little awkward and... Uh, but I think it's the right thing for this morning. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this morning, Lord Jesus, for an opportunity to be in your word. Lord, I pray no matter what day it is, whether it's Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or, or even Sunday afternoon or whenever uh, people are joining me on this study, Lord, that you would just be working and moving by your Holy Spirit through it. That, uh, Lord, you would give us understanding, that you would give us wisdom. And uh, Lord, we want the church to be a healthy place, a place that people want to come, that we want to come, that we can invite our friends, where uh, people will be loved on and will meet you, Lord Jesus. And we recognize the Holy Spirit is just our opportunity to interact with the God of the universe, to have that physical relationship with him. And so we just invite you here right now in this study. In your name, Jesus, amen. Well, if you have, uh, well, if you're probably using one of your devices, you're going to actually have to grab your real Bible now. Grab your Bible, and we're going to turn over to 1 Corinthians 14. Last week, we were in chapter 13 talking about love and how these gifts are exercised through love and where we actually landed and finished. I want to read again chapter 14, verse 1. It says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. This verse is actually really important as it relates to the last chapter because I know many uh, are, were thinking, because I myself thought the same thing, is like, oh, you know, love is more important than even any of the gifts. And that, well, we can just default to just as long as we love people and then and, and it's a, just kind of another way to maybe, you know, at least for me, it was to kind of discount the gifts. But this verse actually is clarifying that Paul is actually not saying, okay, we're going to love and, and really just do that and not have the gifts. He does eagerly desire that each of us would have gifts, that the gifts would be expressed and moving and working in the church. There's nothing in the Word of God that says these gifts are for some other time period uh, but that they are for today, right now, for every one of us. What he is saying is that love has to be the basis for the gifts. The core at which the gifts are expressed and used and exercised within the church. We need to have God's heart as we use the gifts that he gives us. And yes, he, he wants us to actually desire greater gifts or more gifts or different gifts and so right here he actually says especially the gift of prophecy and what Paul is going to go into is really just two gifts prophecy and tongues but before we go there I just I want to have a reminder of 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 all the gifts because I think as yeah we're talking about these two gifts but but Paul is going to give some guidelines as we use these gifts, and already has, and I just want to be reminded, what are the gifts we should be seeking? Well, uh, we started actually in Romans chapter 12, and so you can flip over there, and verse 4 says this, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members are not all the same, not, 
and these <laughs> just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others this is why we have to have love working we belong to each other and and this is why Paul was saying there that love always trusts it always protects and we always you know believe in the goodwill of the people that we are partnered with the members of the body and so we need to be working with each other not against each other and 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 this is where it makes it probably more sensitive in a certain way because we all belong to one another well what you do affects me and what i do affects you and so we always need to have that humility as we use these gifts and he says we have different gifts verse six according to the grace given us always through grace do, do I deserve the gifts I've been given? Not at all, but by grace. Should a person be in that leadership position or this leadership position? Not at all, but by grace. Grace, 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 grace. God gives according to what he desires to do and, and how he works. And guess what? We don't get to go, oh, God, you made a mistake, or I don't like that, or whatever. I need to go, okay, God, if this is what you want to do, how do I get on board with your plan and your desires. And he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it to the proportion of his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And that word leadership even could be, you could use the word administration. And then if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And these gifts, as I, as I shared the last couple weeks, you know, come into conflict with each other because they're coming from a different place. The mercy people <laughs> struggle with the administration people. <laughs> and the administration people struggle with the mercy people. And, and those that like to encourage, there are, there are those that, you know, well, if it's prophesying, the prophesying and the encouraging might run into conflict with one another. And so we all need to recognize that there are going to be these love collisions. So there's those gifts Paul listed there in Romans chapter 12. And then we come over to 1 Corinthians 12. Just think chapter 12, that's where you can find the gifts. And he says, now to each one of us, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12, to each, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That is going to be something very important for us to keep in mind as we study today. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge. Okay, so these are separate from really even prophecy or other gifts, although sometimes the gifts kind of flow into each other is what we are going to see and to another faith by by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by that one spirit to another miraculous powers to another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues and that word tongues we're going to talk about that in a little bit and still another the interpretation of tongues all these are the work of one and the same spirit and he gives them to each one just as he determines again god gets to determine and why does he give somebody maybe a gift of administration that shouldn't have it because he's a good god and he's a benevolent god and he's a graceful god if you have gifts that are outside of maybe your natural skill set just thank the lord thank the lord and be humble in how you use it and, and those of us that we think we're special, well, it's the same thing. We need to realize God has been benevolent in giving us. And he goes on in chapter 12, okay, he says, verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the
the greater gifts. Now, sometimes I have heard studies where, okay, there's the, there's the spiritual gifts, but then there's works, and there's, you know, and we try to separate these things out. Here's the deal. The gifts, the, the ways that we serve, the manifestations of the way the Holy Spirit shows up come in all shapes, sizes, and forms. Uh, you can have gifts that are working through a person's service, and, and, and then you've got a person's skill, and sometimes God takes advantage of that skill and gives them greater skill through his giftings. It, you know, for me, um, I have a hard time sorting it all out. I just know that sometimes positions in the church, jobs in the church, flow because of the gifts that that person has. But I cannot separate those out. When we're talking about spiritual gifts, these are things that God gives us, I think, outside of maybe our natural abilities, okay, and in a greater capacity, but it can, the problem is it can go along with my natural gifts, and, and so it's, it's hard to separate all this out. Let's just, let's just say, you know, God gives all of us abilities in different ways, and hopefully it's spirit-inspired, and, and we see that happen in the book of, or not in the book of, in the Old Testament. Uh, Joshua, I don't know, he, he was a natural military leader, okay, but he led Israel militarily, uh, he, he led them in, spiritually as well. Moses, not really the one even wanting to step up and be the leader, but God gave him gifts of leadership. And we know that that ran into conflict with his sister, Miriam, who's like, who put this guy? You know, God, you know, well, I'm a leader too, and Aaron's a leader too. And you remember there was that coup that kind of happened there. And Miriam contracted leprosy. Why? Because Moses was God's chosen guy. Why was Moses chosen? Not because he wanted it, not because he was overtly special, but by God's grace. And it says in the word that Moses was one of the hum humblest men in the Bible. And so we see God gifting people in different ways, in different positions, not because of you know, some, some thing that they deserve or even possess to do what they do. And it's hard for us to separate all of that out. So these giftings uh, come, come into contact with positions and with jobs and with areas that we serve in. And we just need to always, always, always keep that in mind. Okay? And now in chapter 14, Paul is going to talk about two positions in, por in particular, the, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, okay? So he says, follow the way of love in these things, but he does say, eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. And so he actually is himself saying in the church, maybe, that the gift of prophecy is one of the bigger ones. Now, I can personally say that prophecy... Uh, sometimes, sometimes you have the gift, you don't even know you're using it. For me, Sunday mornings, or even right now, maybe, as I'm speaking on a video, I don't have anyone in front of me. I haven't talked to you this week, okay? So if something touches your heart, and you're like, uh, was he reading my mail? How did he know that that was going? Well, that is where that gift of prophecy can be exercised. So I know that sometimes I flow in the gift of prophecy. I wouldn't say I'm a prophet or that's my main gift, but I do flow within that gift at times as is needed. And that's one of the things I've seen with the way of the Holy Spirit. God gifts and baptizes a person in his Holy Spirit as is needed for the time or the place or the area, or wherever they're at, and wherever they're serving, and, and so we always need to keep that in mind, just because I was gifted over here at this time for this thing, doesn't mean that's just my one thing, and I'm going to do that for the rest of my life, I always pray, like, God, give me what I need for the, for what you want me to do, and so I think it's very important that we think in that way, that it's not just, oh, you're just, get, and this is your one thing that you do, and that's your one thing that you add to the church. Some of us, it may be, 
you may flow in one gift, one area, one place of the church for the rest of your life. For others of us, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to, based on how, where we're serving or what the need is in the church, we need to pray, God, I, I want the gift to work with, well, kids or whatever it is. I, I need a gift of teaching right now. You, you're leading me to do a Bible study and I, boy, I don't feel, uh, you know, like I should be doing that. And so I do believe God can give us gifts as is needed for wherever we're at. And, uh, you know, and so um, I've seen it, you know, things, you know, those gifts come and go just as much as the Holy Spirit sometimes comes upon us. Sometimes, sometimes he's not flowing in that moment or that area. Jesus even knew at certain times that the power of the Spirit was on him for healing at different times. And so he was healing. But he, was he just going around healing people all the time? Not at all. Sometimes he went to one person. Sometimes he healed the whole group. It, it, you know, it's really just us staying in the flow and walking according to the Spirit, as Paul lines out in chapter 5, where he uh, talks about the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I want to do before we jump in is I, I want to clarify some things about prophecy and tongues in particular before we jump into chapter 14. And so I'm going to ask you guys, I want you to turn first of all, and I want to talk about the gift of prophecy. And I believe Paul is probably talking about prophecy and tongues because these are the two probably most confusing of the gifts and probably the most exercised of the gifts in the church, but, but probably where there's the most ignorance and confusion. And one of the biggest ones is the gift of prophecy. So Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says this. And why am I doing this? Well, I personally believe that we see prophecy in the Old Testament and we assume that it's the same in the New Testament. I personally, this is Pastor Kelly, I personally do not believe God uses prophecy in the same way that he did in the Old Testament that he does today. And why is that? Right here, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In the Old Testament, prophets were held in high regard. You actually went to the prophet to have him tell you the word of God because they did not have the written word as we have it today. Well, they had scrolls, they had written down the law, but not that, you know, for the everyday things. And so the prophets would go to the kings and tell them what was going on. A prophet would, would say these things that were not written out in the scripture. They were saying other things that God was maybe wanting to tell Israel about that idolatry and whatnot. The, the prophets held great power. We know Elijah, Elisha, they did miraculous. I mean, they had not only had prophetic gifts, but had miraculous gifts. They did extraordinary miracles, and, and they were powerful, and God did that to prove that what they were saying was his mighty word. And, and so... So the, the, the prophets were, were just, I mean, they expressed the word of God. And I'm not saying that prophecy today isn't the word of God. But where we go primarily for the word of God, to know what God is expressing, what he's desiring to do, we don't just go to a prophet. We go to Jesus himself. And it's really important for us to understand that. What he's saying is, I used to speak through prophets long ago, Hebrews 1. But now I am speaking through the Son. This is where for me, in the church, we filter everything through the gospel. This means when a prophet speaks, I take what they say and I can actually evaluate it and filter it through what the word says. And their word needs to match up or line up with this word. I have seen this particular gift abused. 
because someone comes into church and they say, well, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. This is what God is saying. And it's contrary to the word or not quite in line with the word. And you go, well, that doesn't sound right. But you need to listen. I'm a prophet. And this, I mean, and so what we do is we say, well, what the Spirit says overrides what the word says. But what we're learning, what we need to understand, the Holy Spirit stays in line with the word. The Holy Spirit is really Jesus himself. And so it's important for us to understand that because there are some things that have really gotten out of line. It's not like it was where when the prophet comes in and says something, well, we need to jump and we need to listen to what they were saying. But even in the Old Testament, God would say, well, if the prophet says something, predicts some kind of thing for the future and it doesn't come true, the prophet's a liar. And so there were ways to prove even in the Old Testament. But I think a lot of Old Testament prophecy too was foretelling. It was also mixed with forthtelling, which is just speaking about what was going on right now and what God was going to do. Okay, But now in the New Testament, I believe it's more forthtelling and less foretelling. And we kind of mix this up. I think there is a time where we, we speak uh, tongues, and tongues is mixed with prophecy and confused between it. An interpretation of tongues is really a prophetic word and not a, a tongue message, and we'll get more into that later. And so that's why, why Paul is getting into this now. Now, a, another proof for why prophecy is not the same as it was, is that as Hebrews 1 tells us, right, that, that now he's speaking through the Son, well, that agrees with John 1, where he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, speaking of Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made in him was life and that life was the light of men the light shines in the darkness right he was in the world and though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him he came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him yet to all who received him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of god children born not of a natural descent nor of human decision or husband's will the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So when somebody says, thus says the word, see, we need to be pointing them to Jesus, the word made flesh. What they say should line up with what ultimately what the New Testament is saying. And many times, Prophecy, that gift is used to actually confirm something that we already know God wants to speak to us. Paul is going to say a little bit in here that we will get into further, but I just, I want to, I want us to kind of have these scriptures in these places as a little precursor to what we're going to get into. Now, as I've said before, you know, your own personal devotions can really uh, add to what, uh, what God uh, is wanting to speak on any one particular week. And again, this week, it was that for me. I was in Second Peter. So you can turn to Second Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, 16. Actually, I think it's chapter 1. Sorry, not chapter 2 of Second. Jonathan's laughing at me back here. Chapter 1, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We need to realize the word became flesh. Peter and these guys, eyewitnesses. They're not telling you something they just made up or that just have, you know, well, God, God's giving us some new, you know, new thing, which he was giving them a new thing, but something they invented or made up. There are concerns for me sometimes in the church that a person is making something up and they're doing something that actually misleads you and I or manipulates us 
or is, is in the way of false prophets that are taking advantage of people. And so I realized that I'm going to stick with the scriptures. These things were not made up. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus. And it's for, for he received honor and glory from the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That was the Mount of Transfiguration. We ourselves heard his voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. Prophecy now and even the word of God now is even making their word more certain. Because there was an element of the Old Testament prophets that was pointing us to and speaking to Jesus. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand. Now, here is an important piece. No prophecy of Scripture came about by the person's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Old Testament prophecy, still by the Holy Spirit. New Testament prophecy, still by the Holy Spirit. Now, can you say, I, I can't help it? Well, we're going to learn something today in chapter 14 about this, where, yes, we can help it, but we just need to realize that when it comes from, when it's real prophecy, and it's coming from the Lord, and it's by the Holy Spirit, it should line up with scriptures. It's not something that I make up. It's not something I invent. And I always need to think to myself, is this something that I'm conjuring up in my own brain or something that I'm feeling emotionally and I'm wanting to share it out of that? Or is this really something the Lord is birthing in me? Because of what he says next in chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. I think it's great that Paul is do, getting a little more specific about prophecy within the church. Why? Because of this. Peter, Paul, John, all of our New Testament writers very clearly said in these last days, false teachers, false prophets are going to come. Folks, we need to be careful. We need to be careful. Is that really something from the Lord? Is that really what he's wanting to speak? Or is that something someone's using to manipulate me, to, to uh, take advantage of me? And he even goes in the second chapter. If you don't know what a false prophet looks like, read chapter 2 there in Second Peter. He goes into what false prophets look like. They're greedy for money. They, there's, there's things about their personal life. Okay, there's, there's ways that they live. Anyway, we could go into that all day, but I think it's important when we're talking about spiritual gifts that we make sure they're from the Spirit. And how do we know they're from the Spirit? Well, part of it is they will line up with the Word. We don't get off from the Word. We don't, the, the, the quote-unquote Spirit doesn't trump the Word. The Spirit, the Word, and Jesus all line up together. They all stay together. If I'm going to default to anything, I'll say what Jesus said trumps anything else. You know, I'd rather go, okay, Jesus said this. The apostles seem to say this. Do they contradict one another? No, they don't. But Jesus said this. So if we just get legalistic in a way, I guess maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be legal, legalistic on the side of this is what Jesus said and disregard everything else. But I take all of it and, you know, with, within the context of what God is doing and how he's moving and how he wants his word uh, to come forth. Now, speaking of tongues, the only place in the word that we see this gift actually being exercised in any practicality or anything, where it doesn't just say, oh, they spoke in tongues, but we actually see how it worked and what that looked like is in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And so chapter 2 verse 1 of Acts says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a, 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 suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven 
and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And the word there is really languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were, they were staying in Jerusalem. God, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Bewilderment. Because each one, now listen to this, each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utter, utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Meaning the language of the country they were coming from. Parthians, Medes, Elamites. Res, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them, now listen to this carefully, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. It seems to be uh, these people were worshiping there. Now, I had the awesome opportunity of going to Israel and being on the south steps, and that's where this took place, and it's kind of awesome to see where it happened. But it says that they were declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. They were not prophesying in that moment. I think this is going to be important. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Okay, so... We recognize tongues comes with a bit of amazement, but also some confusion depending on where you are. But in this case, these were actual real languages spoken that these people could understand and interpret and, and hear what they were saying and know what they were saying. Now, there are some that say, well, that's, that's exactly how tongues works hardcore, you know, it's got to be real languages, and if it isn't, you know, it's not tongues, this and that. Okay, so let's, I, I was one of those. I was one of those, and I've been one of those for a long time. I actually want to share a little bit about tongues just from the place in my own life that I have actually had opportunity to exercise this particular gift, and I think that Paul is going to help us to understand what the purpose and the place of tongues is in the church. Let's turn over to, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And what do I think Paul is going to say here? And, and is saying here what happened in chapter 2? Well, I actually think personally tongues is a gift that's for the individual to utter things to God. Meaning it is to assist in worship of God. It seems to be that's what was taking place in Acts chapter 2. When you read in Romans 8, 22, okay, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. I can say in my own personal worship experience, there are days where I have so much going on emotionally. I have so much going on in my mind and my heart that to be honest, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to ask God. I don't even know what to say to God. If I was to work, I don't, I don't even know how to worship. And I'm struggling with those words. And I believe God has come to me and helped me to literally do this. Groan. Groan in the spirit, right? With words, with things that I don't know what I'm saying. But I know the Lord knows. Now, 
Are they real languages that if somebody was standing next to me and they spoke that language, they can understand? Maybe. I, I don't know what I'm saying. But I know I'm uttering things as it comes to me. And I am being refreshed in the spirit, although my mind is very, very unproductive. I don't even know what I'm saying. I know what it's doing. But I'm like, man, that's, I, I'm able to say some things in my groaning that I couldn't otherwise. And maybe there's just some things about God that we don't have the ability to say on this earth that they can express in the heavenlies. I don't know. But I know that there is a place for what I would say is spiritual groaning, but really just spiritual, personal worship. And the Holy Spirit comes in and gifts me and enables me to worship God in a way that I can't do in that moment or at that time or in probably maybe even on this earth, okay? And so I am finding that I believe, and what Paul seems to indicate in chapter 14, is that tongues is not for the church, but for the individuals in the church, okay? And part of it is Acts chapter 2, what we read there, and that was for the amazement of the people, and there was something that God wanted to do there, and something obviously huge that God wanted to do, because 3,000 got saved, but if you remember, Peter in that moment goes, hey, these folks aren't drunk as you suppose, let me explain what's going on, okay, let me explain what's going on, and people were cut to the heart, they said, what must we do, repent, be baptized, that's what Peter said, so in that moment, that's what God wanted to do, and God accomplished a great work, now, to further help us to understand, I, I want us to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Maybe you forgot this section, but I think it's very important as we talk about the work of the Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, you know, actually, uh, we'll start in verse 9. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So are there some moments in my life where I, I'm struggling in that? I don't understand what God's doing in me and what he wants to do in the people or my emotions, my mind, all of these things. I'm, I'm in this place where I'm, I'm literally struggling, right? And he says, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. And it says, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now, is God going to lead me in that place of confusion? No. But the spirit knows what's going on. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Is there a place that we can be speaking in a way that only the Spirit knows and only God knows? Yes. Can I be refreshed through that and exhorted through that personally? Yes, I can because I know the groanings of my heart. And he says, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, but cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who knows the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I can tell you in these moments, in my personal prayer, devotion, and worship times, that I feel like God gives me an ability to interact in a spiritual way that is other than that moment, that place, or even that language. And that's in my own spiritual, personal worship time. But what Paul is going to say is that it's not necessarily for the group or for the edification of the church. And I want us to think about these things and pray about, is, am I saying, I'm a prophet, and I'm going to tell you the word of God, and thus says God, and I'm going to... No, that's not what I'm saying here. I want us to pray through these things and ask for these things. And if you are in your own heart, struggling, wrestling, I don't know what to say. I, I don't even know what to pray today. I don't even know what to ask God. I don't even know what God's heart is in this moment. I encourage you, speak out and ask God for that, I would say, tongue language. Okay? And I do think there's a place for it.
as we look at spiritual gifts, I want us to ask a few questions. What's the main question? What is the purpose? So in all the gifts, no matter just these two, what is the purpose? Is it just for me? Is it for someone else in this room or that I'm doing life with or otherwise? Or is it for a whole group? Is it for this large group situation that, is, that I'm in? I always must think, is this the right time or the right place? See, there are some times I can go serve somebody or do for somebody, and it's the right heart, but it is not the right time. And me exercising that gift of service actually turns people away or is not what they needed in that moment. Oh, well, they might have needed it, and you can see that they need it, but it's not the right time that God wanted you to do that. So we've got to be careful with all of these gifts, and especially the gift of prophecy and especially the gift of tongues. Is it the right time or place? Is, this, is it for everyone? Is it for just a few? And that's, those are the questions that Paul is going to ask us. Now, that long introduction, let's actually get into the scriptures here. And I don't think it's going to take us very long because Paul is actually very clear when he goes through here. And I want to read the whole thing. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, verse 1. Especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, comfort. Let me read that again. When you prophesy, you speak to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. I can tell you this would not be the primary way that prophecy was used in the Old Testament. Sometimes, but it was more doom and gloom and judgment, okay? And that's the problem I see people thinking, oh, I'm a prophet, and it's doom and gloom and judgment. And again, I do not believe God uses prophecy in the same way now. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like everyone to speak in tongues. Now, hear Paul's heart on that. Everyone, speak in tongues. But I would rather have you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will, it, will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as a flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. A little bit maybe of what I'm doing this morning over this video, but hopefully maybe somebody will watch. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but in my mind, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving? Amen means so be it. You may be giving them thanks. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. 
I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Did you hear what he said there? I would rather speak five intelligible words than 10,000 in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> right? <laughs> Grow up. Here he's saying, grow up in regard to, the, to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults, okay? So what is Paul telling us today? I'll say it again. Be an adult. Be an adult. And as some of you young adults uh, understand, adulting is difficult. Adulting is really hard some days. And so may we, may we excel in that. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues, and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? You're, they're drunk with wine. And as Peter says, ah, it's only nine in the morning. Don't worry about it. They're not crazy. But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among them. Now, I want to stop there for a minute. Probably the most difficult part in this whole section there are verses 20 through 25, where it's talking about this prophecy from Isaiah and the believers versus unbelievers. And it's almost like Paul is kind of contradicting himself. He says, tongues are for the unbeliever, but then the prophecy, it seems like it's like, don't do tongues, do prophecy, because prophecy, they'll be you know, convicted and saved. What is he saying there? Well, really, this prophecy comes from Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 16. And if you go there and read it, and because we don't have all day, well, I have all day because obviously no one's here. I can go as long as I want. No one's going to fall out the window, right, Jonathan? So, uh, so but, but in chapter 28, Isaiah is speaking. He's saying, Israel, you are not listening to what God says. So the sign will be to you, foreigners are going to come in speaking in different tongues. And the sign is that God's judgment is coming. So in Isaiah, when it's talking about unbelievers, it was talking about Jews who really were refusing to believe what God wanted to speak. So when Paul's saying there, it's for the unbelievers, it's for people that are hard-hearted and not wanting to listen up to the Lord. But the sign in Isaiah was, because of your unbelief, this, God's word is coming forth and Babylon's coming in, Assyria's coming, they're taking over. So it's actually not in a overtly positive light, right? And so so let us not be, well, we need to have tongues in the church, and how can unbelievers be met, or this and that. The unbelievers he's talking about there are just hard-hearted people. They actually know God, in a way. They, they even, you know, were followers maybe at one time, or not. Whatever it was, and it's for them that, hey, God is working here, and you really should be listening up. But as even in the case of Israel, what did they do? They harden their hearts and they refuse to believe. It's the same thing that even as we go into the prophecy of Revelation, God starts pouring out his wrath and doing all these things and, and the heavens are opened and we see what you know things for what they are and it says, yet the people still refuse to repent and believe. So I would say if God is pouring out his spirit and tongues are going on, this and that, that might not be a good place for us to be in that God has to do that to, to make himself known, okay? And can tongues be used? Yes, we see that in Acts chapter 2. Paul's saying, hey, I wish everyone was speaking in tongues. What I'd want to do is kind of look at the comparison that he makes between prophecy and tongues. 
and I wish we were live and I could, you could see my, my notes here because I really just did a two, two sides and, and we're going to go through it. But what's the difference between prophecy and tongues? Because many times what happens is someone speaks in, in tongues and someone interprets it and it actually comes across more like prophecy than worship of God. And I want to say, why didn't you just speak in English? There are parts for me that I ask, what is the purpose of God speaking in, don't want to seem too politically incorrect, but an all-white congregation and an all-American congregation where there are no foreigners present, what would be the purpose? And if, as Paul says, if God is stirring some tongues in you, you should pray that you can interpret it, I want to say, why don't you just give us the interpretation, skip the tongues. The tongues just, what's, what's that for? That doesn't, that doesn't help anybody, but the interpretation does. So maybe God's stirring a gift of prophecy. And that's just me. That's just Pastor Kelly. Okay. So when we ask, we're in an American church where we all speak English. Now, maybe, maybe, you know, my friend Bill Penna over in, you know, New York, maybe tongues, you know, would be a great thing for them because they got, I mean, New York is just a melting pot of tons of different people and this and that. It could be pretty powerful if people heard, you know, God speaking in their own language of wherever they came from. And so we always need to be asking that. What's the purpose and what is God doing? And Paul seems to allude to that God tends not to speak in mysteries, but clearly. And so that's why prophecy is, is for, uh, really for the edification of the church. Now, we look at this side by side. Prophecy, he said, speaks to men. Tongues speaks to God. Another reason that I would say tongues is that thing that God gives you to help you worship him better, to help you communicate to God. So one is communicating to men, the other is communicating to God. That's why Paul says, hey, prophecy is just better. One is for strengthening, encouragement, comfort. And I would say tongues, what is it? It expresses mysteries. It's, it's as we see in Acts there, praising God, speaking of the wonders of God. Maybe even, and I'll throw this one in there because, you know, it's not here at 14, but I just want to say, is it for the purpose of worship? One is for the strength and encouragement comfort of the people. The other is for worship. One, my mind is fruitful. I can understand what's going on. I can kind of think through uh, how that works and, and what God is saying. The other one, our minds are unfruitful. We really don't know what's being said except for the one person who has the interpretation or let's say we're speaking in a real language and there's a bunch of you know, people from the Congo and they can understand what the person, I don't know. One is intelligible. One is unintelligible. One, Paul says, edifies the church and Paul seems to be alluding to that one, tongues, edifies self. One edifies the church, one edifies self. I want to say, and I'm just going to add this one, one has a potential for salvation, as he said, if somebody becomes convicted of that they're a sinner and they repent and come to the Lord. The other one has the potential for confusion. That would be Kelly's little addition there. Okay, so read back through this, though, those of you who Maybe God has gifted you with tongues. Maybe you've been in situations where there are tongues. Some might really strongly disagree with me here, but you really can't disagree with the word and what Paul is saying. He is saying, if you have a choice or an opportunity to speak, speak prophecy. Speak in the language of the person, in the language of the group that you're in and not tongues but he goes on to give us some actual rules for what this looks like in the rest of chapter 14 here he says what then shall we say brothers when you come together everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction a revelation a tongue or an interpretation all these must be done for the strengthening of the church there we go just like in chapter 12 for the common good 
for the strengthening of the church. That is most important. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. That is a requirement. So here at Calvary Chapel, if tongues is expressed, it must be interpreted. If it's not, then we're going to table that and save that, and we'll probably ask you to sit down and not share or whatever, because it's important that it would be interpreted. If there is no interpreter, the speaker, speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Hear what that says. Speak to himself and God. This is where I think, and this is what I do. I am speaking to the Lord when I'm speaking tongues. Now, somebody should say, oh, you should let us share in that. And, oh, pastor, it would be so encouraging this and that. Well, no, I, I don't believe that it's for anyone else but me. And, and no one would understand, including myself. I don't, I'm not given interpretations of what that says. Two or three, now here it goes again, two or three prophets should speak, and the others, now listen to this, weigh carefully what is said. Weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. And for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits, now this is a key verse, highlight this, underline it. And I say this for all spiritual gifts, not just, not just prophets, but it says the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. What does that mean? The person you are, I am in control of myself. I am not an out of control. There is no room, right, for, you know, I couldn't help it. There just isn't. There isn't a play, ever a place in church where, well, I was just expressing my gift. I was just doing my thing, and I couldn't help it. God just told me to do it. See, I hear a lot of that in the church, and that is not okay, and that is not right. That is not what God wants us to do. As in all congregations. Now, this is the, we're in where we're going to step on toes. Maybe it's better that there's no one here, Jonathan, as we read this next part. Women should remain silent in the churches. <laughs> don't stress. Don't freak out. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. <laughs> you guys are all just, I mean, it, now everybody shut down. Nobody's listening to me. I get it. Here's the deal. You had in those, in those days, in the synagogues, in the churches, women sitting on one side, men sitting on the other, and, and the thinking is that what happened was, as they were kind of interpreting what people were saying and whatever and listening, women were shouting across the room over to their husbands, or because they weren't next to their husbands, they were just standing up and doing whatever, okay, because there was no, there just was, it, it, there just was a disorderliness to what was going on. Okay, now, do I believe this is a mandate for today? No, because we, you can sit next to your husband, and you can kind of go, hey, you know, I've got something to share. Can I do this? Or do you think I should do this? I have heard of women going, well, I talked to my husband about this, and they told me I shouldn't do it, but, I, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Well, okay, ladies, you know, you need to pray about that. And, you know, but there just needs to be uh, an orderliness to what's going on. Just like it says, women shouldn't have authority over men in 1 Timothy there, okay, it's, it's an authority thing, and it has to do with, you know, if we are to actually evaluate what speakers are saying, and maybe there was a, a place for people to stand up and ask questions or whatever. You know, in our questions, we can actually challenge people. We can, you know, maybe that was going on, that women were speaking out of turn. For myself, I, I uh, in Crawfordsville, we had a lady in our community, and I heard uh, she was they were not going to a church anywhere but the last church she went to and this was firsthand experience she stood up on a Sunday night and blasted and ripped into the leadership of the church and how they weren't doing this I mean just complete and her husband just sank in his chair and didn't say anything and they had to leave that church but it was she was just way out of line of ripping into the leadership and the whole thing. So what was going on here? We don't know. Something was going on in the church that Paul said this. It's the same thing with head coverings, as I talked about before. 
It's the same thing with Paul saying authority in the church, okay? And so there's some of this where there's free expression of gifts within the church, right? And there's a, an open prayer meeting, as we do many times, right? That there was, a, there was something where women were uh, not in line with what was going on. I will challenge this, and this is just Pastor Kelly, personally speaking, from just straight up experience. Most of the time, tongues in particular is exercised in the church. I always see women. I never see men ex exercising tongues, hardly ever. And so there is a question of, as Paul is even saying here, that he would rather have prophecy than tongues. I wonder if because of that spiritual desire for women to participate and do this thing, that Paul was saying, hey, some of those things aren't fitting with what's going on. Wasn't and and don't hear me wrong here, ladies, again. At Calvary Chapel, do women get to speak? Does my wife come up and hijack the microphone occasionally? Yes. So but we are a team. And my wife, there's always a like we we sit down and evaluate. We she knows even I've been like, okay, honey, you know, like the, the services go long, you know, you know, we've talked about time frame of that and what does that look like? And it, you know, and there's been a few times she stepped on my toes or I stepped on her toes, okay? So this is not a perfect system, but Paul is saying this for a reason, and I want us to listen up. And it does say this here. And especially when we're talking about women as pastors and authority in the church, I think this is yet another reason why women are not pastors in the church. Because Paul's the only one saying they shouldn't even be talking. They shouldn't be saying anything, okay? That's what he's saying, okay? But again, can we <laughs> evaluate this correctly and in order with what was going on at the time, where the church was at, and where our church is at? Yes. So don't freak out. Don't just stop listening. But see what it says. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet spiritually, and this is, it's interesting he says that. This is that thing of, this is where people come in and say, well, I'm a prophet, and you need to listen to me, and I'm going to tell you something that no, none of the other churches know. Nobody knows. Folks, everything's been, the mysteries have all been given in Christ. So for you to come in and just say that very thing of like, I know something that no one else knows, this is where Paul's saying, did did the word of God originate? No, it didn't originate with you. Again, those are some of those things that we go, ah, that's a false teacher, that's a false prophet. And that's what happened back in the 70s so many times when these false teachers, false prophets came up. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, now listen to this. Let him acknowledge that what I am writing you is the Lord's command. He is challenging that if you believe you are spiritually gifted, you should agree with what he is saying. You should agree. That's strong. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Why is he saying this? Because so many prof false prophets are coming into the world. So many false teachings, so many false things. And he says, therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy. Now listen to this. Be eager to prophesy. This is what I want you to do. Prophesy. But do not forbid the do not forbid speaking in tongues. We don't discount it. We don't say it can't happen here or whatever. I'm not, you're not, you're not going to come to Calvary Chapel and if you spoke in tongues, oh my gosh, you would be excommunicated from the church. Now, there are other churches you might be, but again, Paul's not saying it's, there is no place for it. But let us be a mature group of believers that thinks through carefully how we express these gifts and use it. I am encouraging you. I wish that everyone had a worship language as I do. That's what Paul's saying. Paul had his own prayer language. I have my own prayer language. I will probably never speak it to the body or out in a, a large group prayer time. You might even hear me under my breath speaking it because it's for me. It's not for the rest of the church. Now, am I being selfish with that? No, it's just... I do think through and I want things to be clear. I don't want to bring confusion. And he says, 
but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. And so I have seven rules or guidelines for spiritual gifts. And I'm just saying spiritual gifts in general. He's speaking specifically of prophecy and tongues, but he says this. One, number one, it's for the strengthening of the church, for the common good of the church, edification of the church. Number two, it needs to be orderly, fitting, and peaceful. And I have been in other church meetings and prayer meetings that have not been orderly, fitting, and peaceful. As I shared at the beginning of this study, I was in a Bible study that literally the cops were called because the people next door thought we were injuring one another and something was happening. It was that out of order. Number three, one at a time. That's just the mode. It says maybe two or three or four people have the same gift, right? Or want to share the same thing. One at a time. One at a time. And I say, just like Jesus said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Wait. And maybe you won't share at all. Maybe, maybe time runs out. Those of you who are strong, um, I would say gifted and strong prayers when we're in a large group meeting, be comfortable in the silence. Allow opportunities. And I'm working on this one because I do not like silence. You know, when it's silent, I, I feel the need to say something or to pray something or to prophesy or, you know, share some scripture or something like that. Man, let us be comfortable in the science and let's wait for those who are maybe l more timid or thinking of exercising some gift within the, the large group. Let them have that opportunity to do that. And so I think one at a time, just like when we get together and pray, we pray one at a time. And I love it when the two start together and one goes, oh, you go first. That's, that's how it should be. Number four, number four, what is Paul saying here? No interpretation, no tongues. And so when you, when you are thinking of speaking tongues, you gotta, you got to know, either know you have an interpretation, and what I want to challenge you, if you know what the term interpretation is, just give the interpretation. Let's bypass the tongues. Tongues doesn't help anybody, but the interpretation is what we need to hear. Maybe it's a prophetic word anyway. But, if you're going to speak in tongues, you better know there is someone who's going to interpret or there is going to be an interpretation. And if you don't know that, I say keep it to yourself or pray to yourself and allow God to use it in that way. I still ask, what's the purpose of tongues, at least sometimes in an all English speaking setting? I don't know. I think there could be reason for it and there's room for it, but we have to even know what, what is the purpose of what God wants to do. Number five, we weigh carefully what is said or can I just say what is done? There are those who have maybe gotten the don't judge that you be not judged or whatever because they're, they've sat and they've actually weighed carefully what happened in something and maybe they spoke up and maybe they weren't heard because nobody was receiving. But, but is it okay for you to sit there and go, well, I, I don't know about this. And weigh carefully what is done. But you weigh carefully, meaning I'm going to dig into the scriptures. As I shared when I was in the church and there was all these gifts and things going on and all this craziness. It forced me to get in the word. And what does the word really say about the Holy Spirit and what God is doing and what he wants to do in the church. And that's where this study is coming out of a lot of that that I learned then. Is there a place? And those of you who love to share your gift and think you're gifted, you need to be open to letting others weigh carefully what you are doing. And this means that I trust my brothers and sisters as a, as a teacher. And if somebody says, man, teaching just isn't your gift, but this is what I see your gift being, trust that person. Trust, trust if they're probably even bringing it to you, they know they might lose a relationship over it. But I should actually be asking, hey, what, what, what did you think of, and asking mature believers of like, is this, you know, do I even have this gift? Because you might discover that you think you have this gift, but you don't, you know, grandma or mom have been telling you, oh, you're such a great teacher in this and that. And it's like American Idol, man. Everybody else is going, yeah, that's not your gift. So again, there is room. And Paul does say when prophecy is expressed, at least, weigh carefully what is said. Why? Because it's foretelling and forthtelling. And, and we need to make sure it's in line with what the rest of the scripture says. 
Number six, and I said it already, I couldn't help it is not an excuse. Not an excuse. The spirit of the prophet is in control of the prophet. The spirit of the one giving tongues is in control of that person. You, I couldn't help it, all right, whatever, doing my gift, right? I just can't help it because I'm just a doer. I'm just a server. I'm just an administrator. I'm just a whatever. That doesn't fly. You have a choice. And God asks you to weigh carefully whether that's the right time, the right moment, the right people, the right setting, whatever it is. Think before you do, please. And there is room for that. But here's the deal. Don't overthink it either. I think some of you cerebral people, I love you, but you are not actually allowing, you hinder what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do because you overthink it or whatever. There are things with the Spirit you do have to let him flow within you and take a chance. You know, this is why it's interesting. It says to exercise the gifts. Well, when we exercise, we're trying things. We're, you know, maybe doing something we didn't do before or whatever. Maybe try exercising a gift that you've thought, gosh, you know, God has really burned in me and stirred in me in these moments. And I, I, I wish I would have said something or whatever. Or God gave you a word of knowledge and you wish you would have shared it, but you didn't because, well, your brain gets in the way and you're like, well, no, it's this and that. Folks, make sure that that you're, you are allowing the Spirit to work and flow through you. And number seven, if you think that you are gifted, and I don't care what you think you're gifted with, you must, you must acknowledge this. You must. That's what Paul says. You must acknowledge what he's saying here. You cannot say, well, yeah, but my church or whatever. And I don't care what church, I don't care where you came from, I don't care where you learned it from or whatever. You must acknowledge the word of God and what God is saying here. We must have a firm grasp on what the Holy Spirit is desiring to do. Paul in this chapter does seem to be saying prophecy is one of the greater or greatest gifts that we can exercise. We need to grow in the area of prophecy. That means giving a timely word, an encouraging word, a comforting word, maybe a challenging, exhortive type word in a timely manner to the group or to an individual or whatever. And I can tell you when prophecy is exercised in my life, sometimes I don't even know that I'm doing it. So it's not like you're just going to be like, oh, God, give me this word. I'm going to share it. Well, sometimes you're actually speaking prophetically as you're just flowing in the Holy Spirit, just speaking truth into someone's life. And you don't even know it. So Paul says that is the greater thing to do, and he does not discourage the youth, use of tongues in the church. He doesn't encourage the use of gifts of church in the tongues, er, tongues in the church. He doesn't discourage it, but he, doesn't, he isn't encouraging it either. And I think that particular gift, well, you know, there's some things. Is it speaking about languages? Well, yes, but it also is speaking about the actual tongue, the actual organ of the tongue. Doug and I were talking about this in the Greek. So that one is a challenging one to understand. But may I challenge you and exhort you, I think, personally, and would probably have some agreements from other scholars, that tongues is for worship of God. It's about me communicating to God something that's on my heart that I just can't get out that I just don't know how to say it, and whatever, and it's more about that than it is about something I'm trying to communicate to the whole group. I don't believe God is a God of confusion. I believe he speaks to you and me, Americans, in plain English. I believe he speaks to us in a way that we can understand and that we can get what he's trying to do. He doesn't just do allegory all the time and tell me these stories or some confusing thing with, with, without telling me what it means. He spoke in parables. They didn't understand the parables, but he explained the parable. And so we just need to know God always explains himself. He doesn't do mysterious things to keep me in the dark. He wants me to know him. He wants me to have an intimate relationship with him. He wants me to be touched by him. That's what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is, is not to bring confusion into my life, or make me struggle 
It's actually so God can touch me at a level of my soul, at the deepest level of my life. Not just my head, not just my heart, but my soul. He wants to live in me, to be with me. He wants to ex- me to experience his presence. And as I said before, because he knows that our greatest th- need is relationship. And I say, what are all the things that you are doing to try to have relationship in your life? Because you're desperate for relationship. Are you doing drugs? Are we drinking? Because, man, I, the relationships, I, it's, I can go down to the bar and, you know, and we have these relationships that are not real relationships. Are you, are you living in a relationship that you aren't married, you aren't whatever, because you're so desperate, you can't live alone? Um, what places are you going? Are, you know, is even the counseling, not the counseling bad, but I think that counseling sometimes comes because we just need someone to talk to and we just need a relationship. And have you ever thought that God is trying to provide relationship, the relationship with the creator of the universe, the person who knows you best, who knows you intimately, he knows your mind, he knows your heart, he knows you at the soul level, and he's helping you to even connect with a God that, yes, he's out there. He speaks some other language I don't even know. Um, he invented languages, but, but he's given you his Holy Spirit to be in you and with you. But then he's also given you the church. See, see this, is, this is what's important for us is that we understand that God has given us fellowship because he knows of our need for relationship. But that fellowship can't happen like the world, like the world. Because in the world, you're hating and hating one another. This relationship with God is based on love. And when God is involved in it, God is love, and it should be connected through love. The Spirit should bring unity, not disunity and confusion within the church. But God has laid out what that looks like. These gifts are not about, you know, individuals running around and doing this and that and the other thing. That's what the world does right now. It's individuals. Just believe what you want, do what you want. Amazon, I don't even have to go to the store anymore. I just go on Amazon and order something. You know what I mean? I don't even have to deal with the salesperson. I don't have to deal with the checker. I don't have, you know, everything in our life. I mean, are you exchanging social media and internet stuff for real relationship in your life? And you think that somehow you're having real relationship through that. It's interesting the amount of TV shows now that have gone to reality TV. And folks, that is not reality. That is not reality. And yet people are living in the space where they think that the 90-day fiancé or whatever it is, is some reality. And that can be my reality if, you know, if I just do this or that. Folks, God actually has given us a reality of the way relationships work. He is telling us in his word. He is wanting to interact with us. We have a reality of getting together each weekend as a, as a church family. And there is a reality even in these gifts and what God wants to do for you personally, for us as a church, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Will we wake up? Will we, or will we be the people of Isaiah 28, as I said? People of different tongues coming in, but it's because God said, because you aren't listening, I'm having to do something a little more dramatic. Is there something God is trying to wake up in your life? The fire of the Holy Spirit, the tongues, the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in your hearts. And you know the Lord is telling you and showing you and wanting to do something in you. But you're kind of rejecting him. You're, you're, you're not giving in to what he wants you to do. He wants you to change some things in your life. Why? Because it's not good for you. It's taking away from relationship, relationship with him, but also relationship with other people, the thing that you most need. Folks, I hope that we will be the kind of people that desire spiritual gifts and desire to interact with the Spirit, desire to be in relationship with God, the Holy God through His Holy Spirit, that desire righteousness and holiness, that desire wholeness in our relationships with each other.
that recognize the God of love wants to show me what real love is. And, and not this fake reality garbage that we see on the TV or otherwise. Does God want you right now? He's asking to have a relationship with you and you. You've heard it a hundred times, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you today, right where you're at, wherever you're at, you can receive him into your life, into your heart. And then come and experience the joy that we experience here every week at Calvary Chapel through real relationship with real people, really serving one another, really meeting needs. God wants to really meet your needs. Reality. This is, this is way better than reality TV. And honestly, sometimes a little crazier. The love collisions can be a challenge, can be heated. It's, it's, a li- it's harder. It's harder to do this. It's it's sure it's easy to go home and watch TV and, and be by myself and not have to deal with anything. It's harder to come here. But is God wanting to enrich your life in a greater way through the work of his Holy Spirit, through what he wants to do in you and with you? And man, through these gifts and through God, through the things that God has given us here at Calvary Chapel. I want you to have a great day. Let me pray. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you next weekend. Uh, We will be, yes, in chapter 15 and moving on. This is now our final study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, this opportunity. Lord, we've had to just learn about you and what you want to do in your lives and how you want to interact with this and how you want to gift us. Lord, we don't deserve it. Lord, we recognize it's by your grace. Lord, you're giving us things that are way outside of who we are and our our skill set and what we even deserve, Lord, but you want to have a relationship with us and you want to do powerful things, miraculous things, life transforming things in us and in our church, Lord Jesus. We recognize that, Lord, you have come and given us these things for our common good. And Lord, may we be in line and be in step with what your Holy Spirit is trying to do here at Calvary Chapel and with e- within each individual. And Lord, I pray that you would meet every person. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you and has never experienced the work of your Holy Spirit in, in, in his or her life, Lord, she would, they would receive you in. They would, they would ask, Lord, and you are a good father and you will give, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to be better about how we lovingly uh, serve one another, how we lovingly exercise our gifts among the body, Lord Jesus. And help us, I pray, help us to understand And grow up, Lord, and be adults, not children or infants in the way that we handle spiritual gifts and spiritual things in the church. May we properly represent you, God, the God of the universe. Because, Lord, you don't just have a relationship with us, but you want to have a relationship with all kinds of people. Lord, with all kinds of people who are hurting, who are lost, who are dying, who are desperate, Lord, uh, for love, desperate for Uh, this connection, Lord, that don't realize that's what they're missing. Lord, they're hating, they're hated, they're hating one another, and Lord, they need the love of God, their Savior, to come in and give them new birth. And so, Father, help us, I pray, meet us here. In your name, Jesus, amen. Have a great day. God bless.